seven steps to treat anterior open bite in children. So stay tuned to this video because today we're going to have a theoretical part, a practical part, and if you have a patient with an open bite, this is going to help you a lot. Welcome, my loves, to our channel and to this video. Today we're going to talk about anterior open bite, which is one of the most prevalent malocclusions, both in primary dentition and in mixed dentition. It's a malocclusion that needs to be treated, and there are ways to treat it, but we're going to see in seven steps how you can achieve total success in treating open bite, all right? If you're new, take the opportunity now and subscribe to the channel to receive future notifications because we always have lots of amazing videos here to help you. You have a patient with an anterior open bite in your practice and you need to understand the main aspects to be able to provide good treatment. So I divided it into seven steps where we'll be able to understand everything from the initial part of the diagnosis to the end, which is the treatment, all right? The first step would be to know the etiology of this anterior open bite. But isn't an anterior open bite all the same? Actually, it's not all the same. There are anterior open bites where the etiology is classically environmental, and there are anterior open bites where there is some influence from the patient's genetics or vertical growth pattern. What happens is that in childhood, it's so easy and so simple to treat that we we hardly ever see difficulties in cases where genetics are involved, even if the patient is extremely vertical, it's predictable to treat. So regarding the environmental aspects that we always have to observe, we should always think about Greber's triad. I don't know if you've heard about Greber's triad, but to develop an anterior open bite, I need to have number one, frequency, number two, duration, and number three, intensity. So it's frequency, duration, and intensity that lead to the development of an anterior open bite. And in this way, by considering whether this patient is entirely of environmental etiology, or if the patient has some genetic aspect that could influence a very vertical growth pattern, a long face, we can understand and have a clear vision of how the treatment will be, but not only that, a bit more about the treatment, also the stability. Because for those whose open bite is caused by habits and is entirely environmental, we have a malocclusion with a very high, almost 100% stability rate. Now, those with a vertical growth pattern may have somewhat compromised stability. So it's important to know this from the beginning. Among these environmental factors, we have primary, secondary, and occasional factors. It's important to know if this patient has sucking habits. So the first thing we ask is, we look at the patient's fingers to see if any of them are a different size. So if there are habits, if there are respiratory problems, or if there has already been some trauma or some type of craniofacial anomaly, which are the occasional factors. Because mouth breathing can be a secondary factor in developing an anterior open bite. Have you ever thought about that? And the answer lies in the position of the tongue. When I have a respiratory problem, my mouth stays open so I can breathe. If I don't breathe through my nose, I have to breathe through my mouth. By opening the mouth, the tongue, which would normally rest on the palate, drops down. With the tongue dropping down, I start to have a more forward position of the tongue, which can prevent these upper and lower incisors from following their normal eruption path. So this explains why a patient who breathes through their mouth can be associated with a problem like anterior open bite malocclusion, and it can also be linked to posterior crossbite. So step one would be to identify, understand, and know the etiology. Because if this patient has a habit, we're going to eliminate it. But there may be cases where the patient has an anterior open bite and the habit is already gone, but the anterior open bite remains. And that's when we move on to our second step in treating anterior open bite, which is to identify which stage of the patient's dental development we are in. 
Whether the patient is in the deciduous dentition, mixed dentition, or permanent dentition stage. Why? If the patient is in the deciduous dentition stage and the sucking habit is eliminated before age five, half of the patients in the deciduous dentition who stop the habit before age five will experience self-correction of the anterior open bite. In other words, I just need to stay calm, trust in God. No, I need to wait for the position of the teeth to change because the stomatognathic system will create a balance in the musculature and I will also be able to achieve correction of the malocclusion in a spontaneous way, okay? Now, if this patient gives up the habit while still in mixed dentition, there is a high probability that there will not be spontaneous correction of the anterior open bite. So I will need to treat it. And if this patient is already in permanent dentition and has an anterior open bite, just a palatal grid alone will not work the way it does in mixed dentition. You will then have to combine it with corrective orthodontics, brackets, arch wires, and other more complex biomechanics. All right, so the second step would be to identify which stage you are in, okay? And then we move on to our point number three which is to evaluate the patient in relation to how the anterior open bite is presenting. And here we have two different topics. Why? My topic number three is to evaluate the patient transversely. So I am going to analyze the patient in the transverse dimension. Why? If this patient has both a posterior cross bite and an anterior open bite, both conditions in the same person in the same patient I will first address the transverse issue, and only afterwards will I treat the anterior open bite. Because treating the patient transversely can, first of all, eliminate the patient's habit, so the patient can no longer put their finger or pacifier in their mouth. And if they have that habit, it helps with the closure of the anterior open bite. Or, the transverse balance also helps improve the positioning of the tongue on the palate, and this better tongue placement also contributes to closing the anterior open bite. So, evaluate the patient transversely. Our topic number four would be to evaluate the patient's occlusion in relation to the incisors. And why am I telling you this? Because many times patients think that any anterior open bite is the same and that it is treated in the same way. But one of the smart ways to evaluate an anterior open bite is to assess which incisors are more intruded, whether it's the upper incisors or the lower incisors, whether this patient has an increased overjet or not. And why am I telling you this? Because depending on whether the upper incisors are more intruded or extruded, or if there is overjet, just a lingual trainer alone will not work as a good appliance to treat this anterior open bite. You will also need to have treatment with what are called four by two brackets because these brackets will help with the extrusion of the upper segment if it is more intruded or the lower segment if that is more intruded or with the retraction of the incisors, which will ultimately aid in the correction of the anterior open bite. So, a valuable golden tip is this. Evaluate the occlusion of the patient with anterior open bite to determine whether a lingual trainer will be sufficient or if there is a need to combine it with a four by two. Step number five for treating anterior open bite in children is to choose the appropriate appliance. Professor Ray, but how so? Which are the most commonly used appliances? I'll show you the most commonly used appliances for treating anterior open bite. This is one of the most common appliances to treat open bite, a removable appliance with a palatal grid and an expansion screw. So when the patient is a cooperative patient, which unfortunately I haven't seen that many truly good and cooperative ones, you can use it. It consists of an Adams clasp, a vestibular arch, the palatal grid, which is divided in the center, and the expansion screw. So, if the patient is cooperative, it's an option. We also have a treatment we can use when the patient has maxillary constriction and also presents with anterior open bite, which would be a maxillary expander combined with a grid. 
I have to admit that this is not my favorite because I think it's quite a large structure for the patient's mouth. But there are cases where, if you want, you can combine transverse and vertical treatments in a single appliance and use it. Another very interesting treatment would be this one, with a fixed palatal grid combined with a transpalatal bar. So it's going to work really well for you because it provides the structure. The transpalatal bar gives it firmness. It won't tip. You won't have any problems, especially when combined with a fixed palatal grid. So it's going to work out excellently for you. And another option for a palatal grid, which is the palatal grid without the transpalatal bar, is a palatal grid that contours the anterior area and has its grid in the region of the incisive papilla. This is an important characteristic, to have a good palatal grid. Notice these two types of palatal grid, where one worked extremely well and the other didn't work at all. You can see that this palatal grid ended up having very little retention, almost no retention at all, because it doesn't make contact with the lateral teeth. And this other palatal grid worked extremely well because it has several anchorage points, both on the premolars, where I can place small dots of resin, and on the molars. Since the palatal grid is a completely passive appliance, there's no problem adding resin to increase the retention of the appliance. And one last appliance that I really like to use, which isn't actually an appliance, but rather an accessory, is spurs. So when I notice that the tongue is in a certain position, in this case, this patient had their tongue more on the lower arch, I can place two or four spurs, though it's more common to use just two. I create a really strong adhesive system, making sure there's no contamination so the spur doesn't come off. And I also use a good resin. So I can place them in the center of these incisors and train the tongue not to move into that position. Step number six would be monitoring the closure. So here, every month that this patient, for example, has a palatal grid, and you are making adjustments each month with your bird beak or bird beak pliers, so it doesn't go into the mucosa, you're also adjusting this front part of the crib to make sure it's well fitted. While you're doing that, do the following. I don't have a ruler here, but in your practice, have an endodontic ruler to measure how much the open bite is closing each month. And our last step, but no less important, is to evaluate whether the cause of the open bite has already been resolved. One of the factors that leads to relapse is that the tongue still maintains its incorrect position. And that's when we call on our dear lifelong friends, the speech therapists. So every time you finish treating an anterior open bite, call the speech therapist to assess your patient. I don't know how you refer to them, whether it's speech therapist, speech language pathologist, or orofacial myologist. These are the professionals I'm talking about. And then the question always comes up, should I refer to the speech therapist before or after? And the answer is that, in my view, this is my professional opinion. You refer the patient to the speech therapist afterwards. Because first, we fix the structure of the house so that the tongue can be properly positioned and then we address the functional aspect of the tongue. But that doesn't diminish the tremendous value they bring to the treatment. This is just a small part of what you'll find inside the anterior open bite module within the Intercept course. So there are already many doctors on the waiting list. For our next group of the Intercept course, if you want to master preventive and interceptive orthodontic protocols, Treat 100% of the patients who come to your practice with science-based protocols and with teaching methods that you understand that are easy to grasp. Then click on this link. And that way, when we have a new opportunity, a new group, because right now registration is not open, you'll be contacted by our team. I hope you really enjoyed this content and that it was helpful to you. Take advantage and leave me a like if you haven't already. Leave me a like on the video, subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends, and let me know in the comments which part you liked the most. I think that was interesting for you, right? And bye-bye.